Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Ronald Milne, Dean of Educational Resources and Technology here at Yale NUS. I'd like to extend a, a very warm welcome to all and to members of the Singapore Library community and to members of our own Yale NUS community of learning in particular. I don't know if you'd agree, but I think we in the library profession use the term thought leader rather too often and sometimes too carelessly which is why I'm very pleased this afternoon to introduce someone who has genuinely challenged the profession in its thinking and whose influence has had considerable impact on direction of travel within the information community and on national policies. Locke and Dempsey has worked for library and educational organizations in Ireland, the UK and the US. Although he's been much involved in strategy and policy matters, he started working at the grassroots in public libraries, and certainly for me, that's a very good thing. I first met Lorcan over 20 years ago when he was director of UCOL, the UK Office for Library and Information Networking. That was a centre of expertise in digital information management, providing advice and services to the library, information, education and cultural heritage communities. Our paths have crossed uh, a number of times over the years and we worked in close collaboration at a time when we both headed up separate funding programmes for the UK higher education community, Lorcan through the agency of the Joint Information Systems Committee, or JISC as it's otherwise known. A native of Dublin, Ireland, uh, Lorcan now works in Dublin, Ohio, where he's Vice President Membership and Research and Chief Strategist at OCLC. Uh, for those of not so familiar with library ecosystems, and I think there are a number of people here today who may not know much about OCLC, but OCLC is universally known to the library community as a global library cooperative that provides shared technology services, conducts research, and provides programs for its members and the library community at large. Lorcan's blog and Twitter feed are well known, and he's many publications to his credit. Most recently, a chapter entitled Academic Library Futures in a Diversified University System. That's in a book edited by one of our Yale NUS faculty uh, director and director of our Center for Teaching and Learning, Nancy Gleason. It's called Higher Education in the Era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. I commend both the chapter and the book to you. But without further ado, I'd like to welcome Lorcan to Singapore and to Yale NUS and to ask him to speak on the topic, Collection Reflections, How Boundaries Are Shifting in a Network Environment. Lorcan. Uh, thanks very much, Ronald. Uh, it's going to be all downhill from there. Um, uh, uh, that was a very nice uh, introduction, thank you. And I, I'm afraid it's true that I have known Ronald for over 20 years. Um, but anyway. Um, so uh, uh, I'm on my way to um, IFLA in uh, uh, KL, as I understood, uh, understand it, it to, to be called. And I was very pleased when, when Ronald suggested that uh, I did stop here, both for the opportunity to see uh, Singapore, um, uh, to talk to people, and uh, also because uh, of the uh, publication that Ronald mentioned is, is coincidentally being launched today. So that was a happy, uh, a happy coincidence. So I'm going to talk about collections. And uh, for, for those of you in, in libraries, uh, a lot of what I say um, won't, be, won't be very new or, or very challenging or very strange. Um, but I hope um, I, I'll put it in a context and give it a shape that, that might be um, of interest, um, um, I hope. So uh, this is a picture from uh, Case Western Reserve University, and I, I, I quite like it. I, I thought I'd start with a, a picture of collections or stacks, you know. Um, so these, uh, this is, uh, uh, but these aren't quite stacks. I don't know whether you can make out. This is a, a door into a room of stacks. And on the door, there's a picture of people looking through the stacks. So on each door in this library, there's a picture of students or faculty. And it's actually very interesting and very engaging and uh, a good outreach uh, 
mechanism because those faculty or others who have their pictures on the door quite like it and feel good about the library and tell their friends to go to the library and show their families their pictures on the door and so on. So this is, um, this is a picture of two students uh, on the door on the way into the stacks. So I'm not going to talk very much about um, those uh, types of collections. I'm going to talk about you know, what's going on uh, around them um, and uh, how uh, boundaries, if you like, between collecting activities and other activities have, have changed. So this is another uh, picture I, I took. You can tell that I took it because it's slightly blurry. Um, so this is a um, famous library. This is a, a long room at Trinity College, Dublin. And those of you who uh, see library stories in the media, every 50% of library stories in the media have a picture of this library. This is the sort of archetypal media library. When they want a picture of a library from Getty Images or a stock photo of libraries, about half the time it's this library because it's got wood in it and it's got books in it and it, it, looks, like, um, it looks like a library. It's, uh, it's, it's that media picture of the library as, as a calm, reflective uh, place uh, with plenty of wood and, and plenty of uh, books. Now, um, uh, a comment on this type of uh, library, uh, research libraries achieve status by acquiring more than their peers or by building niche collections of particular depth. So historically, a good library was a library that collected lots of things and put them near to the user because um, uh, in a physical world, um, to access materials, you have to be close to them. And those materials are scarce. They're distributed to libraries, to bookstores. Um, there's only a few places you can get them. So a really good library is a library with lots of things in it because it means that you can find lots of things and you save the time of the user. You, you uh, provide them with, with, with what they want. And in some ways, our model of goodness in the library became translated in, in, into collection size or into counts of uh, the use of those collections or circulations or gate counts into, into the library. Now, that quote is from somebody called Dan Hazen, whom some people in the, in the audience may, may recognize. He's a collections expert, a collection specialist, or was at Harvard University. So basically, he worked in the academic library that's sort of at the pinnacle of that research library tree with the biggest collections, uh, amazing resources, amazing diversity of collections, and amazing depth. And he uh, really is a, a specialist and an expert on collection development, on collections in that um, print research library environment. But he goes on to say, collections no longer lie at the center of research library operations and goals even as academic communities focus ever more inclusively on knowledge and information. So the reason I put this up is because it's sort of remarkable coming from who he is in the institution that he is. So collections and library collections are central still to libraries, but increasingly they are one part of the service that, that libraries offer. They're no longer the uh, uh, crux or core necessarily of that library offer. And I think you can, you can see how um, libraries increasingly are sort of telling their story uh, differently. Uh, so uh, some time ago, the library story would be about access to information, access to the collections. Um, whereas increasingly, if you look at academic uh, library websites, I think depending on the, the uh, focus of the institution to which they belong, um, the library story tends to be told in terms of um, three or maybe four things. Uh, it's uh, student success, student retention, student um, um, uh, ability to uh, prosper, to thrive, to do um, uh, well in their work. It's uh, research uh, productivity, research support, uh, the support for uh, the research uh, enterprise. And then it's maybe community engagement or uh, inclusion or something about the role of the library in the bigger context, in the bigger context of the institution or in the bigger context of uh, uh, some uh, social background. This is a library website that I quite like. It's Monash University in uh, Australia. 
And I, I, I think the, the way in which they have the headlines is quite interesting. So libraries, the first heading, that's the physical spaces. The second one is collections. The third one then is research and learning skills. And by that, they mean skills for students, you know, digital literacy, um, um, guidance for uh, students in how to do their work, how to be successful in uh, their academic uh, endeavors. Then you have managing research data, which is research support, supporting the researcher, researcher workflow, um, and then services and alumni. Now, I think until recently, and still quite commonly, library websites lump lots of services together. They have a search box, and interestingly, the search box here isn't at the top. You, you have to go down a little bit to find the um, search box. Um, uh, they have this straggle of services, like, you know, photocopier, research data management. Uh, you know, it's, it's all sort of jumbled, jumbled, jumbled up. So I quite like the way here, there's a distinction between library places, services for students, services for researchers, and then services around collections. If you drill down into the collections area, they actually tell you what collections they have, where they, where they specialize, what they do. So um, I think um, I, I said student success, research support, and then you know, something maybe about community engagement or uh, place of the library in the broader context. We've been doing some work recently with uh, Ithaca SNR in the US, funded by the Mellon Foundation, looking at the characteristics um, of libraries in the context of the characteristics of the universities they serve. And um, you know, Ronald mentioned the uh, book chapter, and, and this is partly the subject of that book chapter. And, and I just thought it would be useful to briefly introduce that in the context of what I'm going to say about collections later. And, what we say is looking at the, the data, the, the uh, statistical data about universities in the US, we, we sort of say we can, we can see, if you like, three poles, three emphases um, in uh, universities. And typically, a university will mix those emphases in various ways. So there is um, research. So this is where uh, an institution or a focus, there's a distinctive focus on doctoral research and scholarship. And if you think about the types of uh, services that that involves increasingly, you've got research data management, you may have research information management, ex expertise profiling, um, that type of thing. You may have text data analysis, digital scholarship, digital humanities, those types of um, support. So the uh, research university um, uh, calls forward sort of those research uh, support types of activities. You're beginning to see new types of skills, new types of librarian. Look for some job titles that you uh, will have seen recently, research impact librarian, research data librarian. The research impact librarian, that's uh, um, um, coming from the whole emphasis on rankings, on bibliometrics, on um, uh, advising faculty on how, where to publish, how to publish well, thinking about uh, citations, thinking about um, the, the uh, role of publication, the role of the library in terms of helping the institution succeed. And then if you think about library stakeholders or people with whom the library partners are important um, people in the rest of the institution uh, with whom it's, uh, it's important uh, for the library to collaborate. You have things like Office of Sponsored Research or VP for Research. So um, you have a research focus. Uh, you have particular services that go with that. You have uh, new job titles. You have uh, university college stakeholders. That then you may have a focus on liberal education, and by liberal education meaning a sort of distinctive focus on it, interdisciplinary baccalaureate education. So um, thinking about the uh, educational experience, thinking about teaching and learning, uh, thinking about um, uh, the student as the, the primary focus. And there, um, if you think about the types of services that the library might provide, increasingly there's an interest in instructional design, there's an interest in thinking about open educational resources. There's a thinking, thinking about um, spaces um, uh, for creativity, you know, um, uh, provision of 3D printers, provision of um, other types of uh, support or service that are required to get uh, their work done. 
some of the titles that you've seen emerging recently, student success librarian, teaching learning librarian. And here, if you think about some of the stakeholders, some of the people that the library needs to interact with, you've got Dean of Undergraduate Education Department Chairs. The third pole, the third focus, the third uh, center of gravity, if you like, is uh, career, career pre preparedness. Um, so here, there's a distinctive focus on preparation for the professions. Um, and if you think about some of the library services that may be of interest, e-portfolios, training and internship resources, um, some of the types of job that you might see, first year experience librarian, a guided pathway support staff. So these, these sort of relate to actual job titles we see emerging. And the types of stakeholder, the types of um, uh, partner on campus, career services, VP enrollment. So, uh, typically, uh, a university will, will have a mix of these. However, the university profile may lean in a, in a particular way. So, large uh, research university typically will have a big focus on research and a big focus on liberal education because, um, you know, the, typically a, a major research library will have strong uh, undergraduate programs as well. So, they'll have a strong focus on liberal education going with liberal arts college, you know, like uh, the one in which we, we currently are, will have a very strong focus on liberal education and maybe less of a focus on uh, research understood like this. There'll be a focus on student research, on the research process, but maybe less on doctoral research. And then increasingly we're seeing institutions which uh, really have uh, a strong focus on career preparedness, on thinking about um, um, uh, providing uh, um, instruction in ways that match on to um, uh, convenience, flexibility, but also uh, relate to particular um, uh, career uh, pathways and help people in terms of certification and, and success in that way. So you, you can see institutions increasingly um, 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 a mix of these things. And one of the things that we're saying is that as things progress, especially in a U.S. context where uh, there's less of a public level playing field, institutions will, will sharpen their focus. You know, they'll, they'll need to, you know, what are we really about? What, what's our, what's our, our offering here? And you can sort of see that happen. And as that happens, the um, library, you know, uh, needs to think about, now, Part of the reason for going into this is to say that increasingly a good library won't be a library with a big collection, a library with high circulation, a library with... A good library will, a li will be a library that fits its institutional profile. A good library will be a library that provides services that are appropriate for the environment in which it, it is. And the model of excellence for a library that we have will be plural because a good library in a, an institution that has a career preparedness focus would be very different than a good library in an institution that has a research focus because the role of the institution is different. And all libraries are increasingly looking to play a bigger role in the research and learning lives of their institution, in moving out into the institution. And as those institutions are different, so are the types of things that the libraries are asked to do. So that's uh, sort of as background because I think this again shows how some of the ways in which libraries are being asked to respond, some of the ways in which libraries need to be excellent, sort of mean that the, the uh, collection as an end in itself is, is less important. What's important is the information resources that are provided in the context of the institutional mission and they're fit for purpose for that. Large research libraries still have a, a mission which includes curation, stewardship of the scholarly records, so they want to assemble large collections. An institution that's focused on career preparedness wants to provide materials that are suitable, digestible, fit for purpose for um, moving somebody along uh, quickly and efficiently. So what I'm going to do now then is, in the context of that background, talk about three, three trends with library collections. Um, one is uh, inside out, uh, inside out collections, a growing focus on institutionally created materials, uh, whether they're special collections, research resources, learning materials. Second is uh, facilitated collections, which is uh, a growing focus on not so much necessarily owning or licensing materials, but on 
pointing to, providing, facilitating access to the appropriate materials at the appropriate time. And thirdly, collective collections, where increasingly we're seeing institutions club together, band together to share responsibility for um, collections. And I'll just say something very quickly there about print collections. And there are lots of other things one could say about collections. So just preemptively, um, yes, there are lots of other things one could say about collections, and I'm not saying everything about collections. And uh, um, um, I do want to say something about these three things. Um, and I want to say something about these three things because I think they relate interestingly to the way in which the network is changing the way we do things. And they also relate inter interestingly to boundaries between the library and the institution or between different uh, historic departments within the library, different ways in which the library organizes itself to get its work done. I am, um, um, just to illustrate a little bit of that, I, I quite like this website as well, largely because it, it sort of shows what I, what I just said. So we, we like websites, we like things uh, that confirm our own prejudices, so this does that for me. Um, so Purdue, um, uh, major uh, American university, big focus on engineering, STEM subjects. Um, so if you think about outside-in collections, which are those collections that you purchase or license and bring into the institution, you know, that's typically, you know, you have a search box, you're, you're allowed to search those. But then down at the bottom, I think in an interesting way, they, they show different classes of inside-out collections. And I think it's interesting because of the way they present them. So they have Purdue EPUBs, a digital document repository. So this is effectively their institutional repository. This is where they have preprints of articles or um, um, theses or things like that. Then they have e-archives. So this is uh, effectively archival collections and special collections. Um, so these are distinctive to the institution. They may be digitized and made available. And then they have uh, PER, which is a homegrown um, um, platform for research data management, which is used by a variety, developed at Purdue, used by a variety of institutions. So these three things along the bottom are sort of institutional Purdue resources that they curate, manage, assist, and now are sharing with the rest of the world. So they're sort of different than the uh, outside in. Then if you think about facilitated, they have, um, you know, uh, subject guides, they have uh, guides to uh, resources that the library doesn't hold, they have information for the student about where to go, what to do to find things. Uh, that's increasingly common. And then collective collections. They have interlibrary loan there, you borrow. Uh, Purdue is part of the Big Ten, which is, you know, 12 or 13. It's the Big Ten, so it's 12 or 13 universities. And the chair resources and have a very efficient uh, consortial borrowing system. So they rely heavily on each other for um, collections. They work very closely together and they treat that collective collection as a single resource available to their local um, community. So that sort of shows some of the things that uh, I was talking about on an actual um, website. So um, the way in which these three things relate to broader trends is the inside-out collection, thinking about research data, thinking about digitizing special collections, thinking about institutional repository. This is because research work has been reconfigured by the network or digital environment. So the uh, institutional research work generates interim pro products like research data or other things that now need to be shared with the world. Um, I'll, say, I'll say more about that, but it's that research work has been reconfigured by the digital environment. The facilitated collection is because the information space has been reconfigured by the digital environment. So it used to be the case, information was scarce, libraries collected it, people came to the library. Now, um, information, uh, all sorts of information resources and a growing role for the library is helping people figure out what to do in this information space, not just buy stuff and bring it into the library. And then um, collective collection is because the li library collaboration itself, the ways in which libraries can do things together has been changed and facilitated by the network environment. So each of these three trends relates to a big change brought about by um, the ability to do things in a network environment, the reduction of interaction costs in a network environment. 
Okay, so if you think about inside-out collection, I'll say something very quickly about these four things, research outputs, expertise, research infrastructure, our infrastructure, and just a, a note on special collections. So if you think about research outputs, this is a picture my colleague Brian Lavoie did. Historically, um, you had, um, if you think about the research process, you have process itself, and then you have the aftermath. Now, historically, research outcomes were just the final product. It was the book or the journal article. That was the research output. And the library collected those, and researchers and student, students could read them. Um, so the library managed the final research output, the exhibition, if you like, of the research process, which is the article and the book. In this digital environment, in this network environment, the process of research generates a variety of intermediate outcomes, or the process of research is mediated by systems and services which uh, need support in various ways. So the process of research is more opened up and, and uh, people, people can see it. And if you think about things there, you have methods. People want to publish their methods. They want to share their methods. Uh, you have evidence, the research data. People want to publish their research data, share their research data. Many funding councils or national regimes are encouraging or mandating people to share research data. And then you may have discussion, you may have preprints, you may have working papers, you may have forums to discuss work and progress. There's also an afterlife or the aftermath of the resource. Again, you may have discussion, but you may have revisions, repurposings, and things may be reused in various contexts. So where once the library was only interested in that final book or journal, increasingly you've got other things, especially around the process. And you can see this quite clearly in the, in the services that have emerged and in, in the ways in which the network environment has changed. So from a method point of view, you've got Methods X, which is a journal that pulls together methods. You've got My Experiment, which is uh, an aggregation site for uh, software and so on that people use in their experiments. You've got a variety of services around research data. Um, uh, scientists may publish software or data in gen general, general resources like GitHub. You've got preprint archives. And then you've got a variety of places where people discuss, you know, they have presentations, posters, and they, uh, where, where research is pulled together. So the environment around research outputs has become quite diverse. The types of things to be managed has become quite diverse. Um, the second area is um, thinking about expertise, reputation. So increasingly, we're seeing a blurring of uh, identity, workflow, and content. As uh, researchers, not everybody, not all disciplines, some researchers, the uh, participation in social networks, the visibility on Google Scholar, um, is an important part of the cycle of their research activity. Their reputation, building their reputation, boosting their reputation is an important part of the cycle of their research activity. So this leads to this blurring between research workflow, content, and identity. At the same time, institutions themselves are increasingly managing institutional expertise. You've got systems like Pure from Elsevier, uh, symplectic uh, elements from uh, digital science. You've got homegrown systems for expertise management. So many uh, researchers will now have profiles generated by their institution automatically using these systems where they have to report a variety of things. They may keep a profile in ResearchGate. They may claim their um, 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 Google Scholar profile. Um, you know, if they have an ORCID, there's a certain amount of uh, management of, of these things. So increasingly, we're seeing this uh, blurring of identity workflow and, and content, but also increasingly, we're seeing a library role in partnership with other campus players and helping people think about that network identity and building uh, reputation. Um, because uh, if you think about your know, reputation, citation, visibility, uh, 
very much the currency of that. Uh, the book uh, that's uh, being launched, The uh, Higher Education in the era, era of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, has an open access version. And it's actually done quite nicely, I think. This is on a Springer uh, website. And um, it, it allows you to go in, it allows you to look at ind individual chapters as PDFs or to read them online, it does various things. Interestingly, though, it links to this metrics uh, page which gives you uh, alt metrics, the, it shows you the number of times individual chapters have been tweeted, shows you the number of times it's been added to Mendeley collections, um, shows you uh, blog posts that have been written about it based on their uh, search of the network. And this is a service to authors. This is something that authors are interested in. They want to see what traction their work has, how, how is it being viewed, how is it being received. So again, this is sort of thinking about workflow identity um, uh, coming um, together, workflow identity content coming together, the, the, you know, the, the uh, interaction in a network environment of reputation and content and that sort of workflow. Um, so again, uh, the library has a role in thinking about how to advise people on uh, playing well in this new environment. And that relates to research infrastructure very strongly. Uh, increasingly, especially in research libraries, uh, the library has uh, uh, you know, a variety of services that might provide in this area. Research data management, support for digital scholarship, research information management, that expertise profiling, um, thinking about uh, managing the institutional outputs in a, in a more programmatic way, institutional repository, variety of training. And then, um, really, this is all done in a variety of collaborations, thinking about collaborating with uh, people in all sorts of, uh, uh, all parts of the campus. So increasingly you have this research infrastructure being built and the library is variably involved, depending on the institution, depending on local personalities and politics, depending on the way in which the library is inserted into the overall uh, process. But these things are increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, important. What it means is you have the researcher who's interested in these things, but you have this new class of research manager who may be in the Office of Sponsored Research or maybe you know, who has an interest in working with uh, faculty and, and thinking about it from an administrative point of view, thinking about it from a reputational point of view, from a management point of view, and then you have the research support in the library. Now, some of you will have seen there's been quite a bit of writing recently uh, about uh, publishers and how the big publishers really are shifting uh, some of their focus or diversifying their systems because of the ways in which publishing are changing and because of these changes. So this is a, a quote from an interview that was done a few years back with Annette Thomas when she was CEO of Macmillan Publishers and she was involved in the setting up of digital science which includes you know, altmetrics, symplectic, a variety of, of services. Um, she now works for Clarivate, um, the publisher of Web of Science. But she said her view is that publishers are here to make the scientific research process more effective so you, you might say, a librarian might say, libraries are here to make the scientific research process more effective. By helping them keep up to date, find colleagues, plan experiments, and then share their results. After they've published, the process continues with gaining a reputation, obtaining funds, finding collaborators, and even finding a new job. What can we as publishers do to address some of the scientists' pain points? So what you're seeing is the publishers are developing basically workflow services. Workflow is the new uh, content. They're developing workflow services that make uh, the scientific process more productive, that automate parts of it, that help with reputation, um, that help with research data management, that help with uh, citation management, a whole range of things. And you can see this happening really. Uh, the interesting thing, though, is you, a university librarian could say exactly the same thing. We're here, we're here to do all of these things. Um, so you can see this very clearly with Elsevier and, and various of the um, acquisitions and so on that Elsevier has made over the last while. Um, you have the librarian who you know, may ha historically have licensed bibliographic resources and journals. What they have done though is they have moved 
upstream to the researcher. So a few years ago, they bought Mendeley, they've enhanced Mendeley into a, a broader you know, research productivity platform. They bought SSRN, the um, social science uh, um, uh, research network. They have a, um, a, a preliminary research data finding service. Hivebench is a lab notebook that they bought recently. Um, and then they've moved the other way into the institution, into the research manager. So they provide uh, analytic services that allow you to benchmark your university, benchmark your researchers, do um, that sort of university research uh, analytics. Um, but they've also um, bought Pure, the research information management system to allow people to um, track research information outputs to generate research profiles. Um, they've bought Plum Analytics, uh, analytics service. And then recently they bought B, B Press, which sort of moves along this um, axis, you know, the institutional repository and expertise profiling service. So if you think about Elsevier, Elsevier is a publisher, but publishing is only one part of what Elsevier does. Elsevier is increasingly provi providing services that track, manage, help make more productive the whole uh, research life cycle. So um, um, publication, content is now embedded in this whole set of uh, services. Finally, um, special collections. Uh, increasingly, people are thinking about special collections in the context of the research they support, the reputation of the institution, and the relevance uh, of the uh, library to the research work of the institution. So we've seen a great, um, we've seen something of a renaissance around special collections in terms of mobilizing them to better support research, um, um, thinking about how they can enhance the reputation of the institution. I think this is a very nice example. This is from University of California, Davis. Um, what they have is a set of wine labels. Uh, so wine, very important to California. Um, um, Davis, University of California, Davis has a, speci a speciality in viticulture. They uh, have academic excellence in relation to wine. Uh, it's important to them as, a, as an institution. So what they've been doing is digitizing the wine labels and then using the result to try and track trends, to try and track um, the ways in which uh, a particular um, uh, wines have uh, developed or um, uh, to say things about the wine industry. So they're trying to develop a, a resource based on their special collection of wine labels that becomes a research resource in the investigation of the wine industry and wine um, over time. So they're trying to do something that shows expertise with data mining, shows expertise with new computational techniques, but at the same time mobilizes a, a special collection area in a new way, and in, in doing that in something that's central to the reputation, central to the interests of that particular institution. So. They are just some examples of the ways in which um, research work, uh, that, that research work has reconfigured this network environment, um, which means that increasingly the library has to support creation, management, and disclosure of evidence like research data, of um, you know, memory like special collections, and then of community like the uh, faculty expertise thinking about um, how to share knowledge about the institution with the world. So this is what I'm meaning by inside-out collection, that the library increasingly is thinking about how its own unique resources, whether they're research outputs, special collections, faculty expertise, other things, need to be managed, need to be curated, need to be supported, and then potentially shared with the world. And how increasingly, especially in research universities, people are seeing this as an important way to align with the mission of the university to increase the institution's reputation to be of value uh, within that context. So workflow is the new content. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but um, it, it is you know, a, a indicative of a trend. Reputation has become very important. How do you manage and disclose the intellectual outputs of the institution effectively? 
It means that there's been, in this area, a shift from discovery to discoverability. What you want to do is to make your resources discoverable. You want to put them in other places. You want to uh, improve the uh, search engine optimization. You want to make your things discoverable. So it, that doesn't mean putting them in a local discovery environment, because you don't want to make them discoverable just by your own university. You want to make them discoverable by the world. So what does that mean? How are you visible in other places? And then that raises this issue of collective collections. Where should you put them? You know, in, in some contexts, you have new aggregations of scientific resources. You have new aggregations of cultural heritage resources. How do you, how do you interact with those? What, what should you do? That's an underused feature of PowerPoint there. Now, um, facilitated collection. Um, so here, because we're seeing the information space reconfigured, it means that the library, again, you know, maybe shifts or uh, uh, behaves in a, in a different way. And here are just some examples. There's no, there's no need to, you know, go through examples. We're all familiar with how, you know, when we want to do something, typically, you know, the web is is our first uh, recourse and uh, often our last recourse. And if you think about a variety of the ways in which people want to do things, you know, answer reference questions, you know, store data, um, um, the uh, social discovery of scholarly resources, um, the, the, the variety, volume of uh, resources that are available is, is great, compelling, interesting, satisfactory, excellent, um, occasionally disappointing, all of these things. And I think uh, one of the interesting responses to this has been the enormous growth of uh, subject guides, lib guides, and other things, and in many cases associated with expertise, with library expertise. Um, subject guides are the tribbles of the library community. You know that Star Trek thing where you have tribbles, they just keep growing and growing. You look at a library website and you have a few subject guides you come back in a few months and it's all subject guides, everything, everywhere, and all libraries are doing this. And it looks like subject guides are this ivy that's growing up library websites all over the place. And, and they're, they're all developing these uh, subject guides, um, you know, very often using libguides, uh, which is enormously, enormously successful and fast growing um, service. But, you know, they do the tribbles of the library community. So the top, top one is um, MIT libraries. And I think it's interesting the way they present it because it's uh, research guides and experts. So they're presenting libguides, but they're tying it very closely to expertise. They're saying these are resources curated by our expert staff, and here are our experts whom you can also look for. So this is an association of expertise and um, the libguides. And it's also uh, done to some extent, not as, as prominently um, um, with um, uh, uh, local, very local um, uh, institution where the uh, expert library staff are associated with the subject guides and you have the conjunction of resource librarians and subjects in the... So the, there is this movement, uh, I think, um, to associate these resource guides with the expertise and the resource guides, I think, are a very pure form of facilitated collection. Basically, what they're saying is, there are all these things that you are potentially interested in that we don't hold here, that, we, that aren't part of our collections. It may include a description of our collections, but it also includes these other things. So the, the resource guide is an overview of the types of things that you might um, find interesting or useful, some of which may be in our collection and some of which may be um, elsewhere. So I think there is sort of that quite pure form of a facilitated collection. So if you think about the network environment and the trajectory we've been on, um, in, a, in a print environment, you had this print logic that you had to distribute print copies to multiple local destinations. Um, so a print logic means you know, for you to access something, you have to go to it or it has to come to you. The library model is you know, resources come to the libraries and you only have to go to the library. So print model, physical distribution. And network logic means that um, you can provide a coordinated mix of stuff that's local, uh, 
um, stuff that's external or stuff that's collaborative, and you can surround the user with that. So it's a very different uh, view of, of the world. With a print logic, the value relates to the size of the locally assembled resource or the, the um, careful curation of the local assembled resource. And that's still valuable, but it's valuable now in a bigger uh, context where other things need to be done as well. In a network logic, the value relates to the ability to efficiently meet a whole variety of research and learning needs. Uh, the, the value relates to the ability to provide the student uh, with what they need at the time they need, not to say we potentially have something in the collection that might be of interest. And you can see over time a, a progression that, you know, at one stage we had the owned collection, which was purchased, physically stored. Um, then uh, we had the borrowed collection, where the library could borrow materials from other libraries because no library is, is self-sufficient. Then we had the licensed collection, where um, um, uh, there was a gradual replacement of bought physical journals by initially licensed abstracting indexing services, then licensed um, journals. Um, and that, by the way, with you know, major implications that we haven't really worked through about the curation of the scholarly record, the ownership of the scholarly record, and so on. I mean, most people now license uh, journals. Then we had the demand-driven collection, increasingly, where um, in, in, the, in the owned collection, the collection drives discovery. You provide a discovery service that provides access to what you own. The catalog tells you what you own. In a demand-driven environment, increasingly, discovery drives the collection. You provide access to a collection of material, and then depending on how people use that discovery environment or how people want materials, um, stuff is added to the collection. So there's a sort of interesting inversion there. And then increasingly, certainly in, in certain areas, we're seeing the shared print collection where libraries are consolidating their print resources. Um, we're seeing uh, shared digital collections. You know, you have DPLA in the, in the US, Europeana, where people are consolidating their um, digital collections. And we're seeing evolving scholarly record where there are a growing number of aggregations of scholarly resources. So what's happening is that you, what you have is the owned collection is being complemented by increasingly facilitated collections where there's less ownership and there's more facilitation or pointing to stuff that's available in other places. And importantly, uh, we can see primary examples of this in terms of you know, what you might call the external um, collection where uh, people will, uh, libraries will point researchers at Google Scholar or proxy access to Google Scholar. Um, they will um, include freely available ebooks in their catalog, um, identify open access materials, and you know, various services clearly are emerging in that space where you know, rather than purchase or acquire material, you facilitate access to open access materials that, that are available and creating resource guides for web resources. So this is effectively providing services that provide access to. Now, I think there's been a considerable shift in this direction, but we don't tend to think about it because it happens in a variety of places. Much of the stuff that happens on the right happens through subject librarians or others rather than through collections activity. But, in, but if you think about, um, rather than thinking about purchase collections that you provide, if you think about the materials that you provide for your researchers and learners, an increasingly large part of those, it's facilitated. You're, you're saying, hey, this might be of use to you. If you're doing this, what about this? Rather than we've bought this um, for you. So I think there's been a major shift here. And obviously, um, libraries have variable investments across the spectrum. This is still very important for some types of libraries, less important for others. All libraries are doing quite a lot of stuff further over. So facilitated collection, increasingly we're providing ways in which people can find things, use things outside of the collection. I'm putting a large amount of resource into that. It doesn't tend to be quantified because it's not a department for facilitated collections. It happens in different places. So I think one um, consequence of this 
is that we're seeing maybe local collections become a little bit more specialized. You know, what, what, if, if I can't collect everything, I can point to stuff that's available elsewhere. I rely to some extent on collaborative arrangements. And one thing that's emerging is not so much special collections as specialer collections, specialized um, collections. And uh, I quite like this example. It's, it's near us. This is uh, Bowling Green University in Ohio. It's a public, a sort of uh, public university, strong regional public university uh, in, in Ohio. And it has a specialization academically in popular culture. But it also has a library that specializes in popular culture. So they, there's a specialization going on there uh, where they are uh, collecting resources in, in this area uh, because of the local academic um, specialization. Um, so it's not a special collection. It's, um, it's a distinctive, it's a, it's a collection geared around the academic interests of the institution, um, which I think we're seeing uh, potentially increasingly happen. So facilitated collection, reconfiguration of the information space by the network environment drives certain ways of thinking about collections, potentially specialization of locally held collections, it drives engagement because, um, you know, in terms of figuring out what people want, what they want to do, you, you have to engage with faculty, engage with students, think about how, uh, you know, what particular um, uh, pedagogical needs there are, research needs there are, uh, what things are useful in the context of um, that life of the user. Also means that uh, diffuse responsibility for stewardship of scholarly record, and that's something that we haven't really grappled with. Historically, a major role that libraries had, and it was a benign consequence of the distribution of print materials to many places, was curating the scholarly record. Now I think there are you know, questions about library role there and, and what will happen that because uh, it's not as clear cut anymore. So uh, quickly, the third area, uh, collective collections, um, and this is something that's of uh, a big interest to OCLC at the moment because it's of a, a very big interest to American academic libraries who are a large part of who we serve, but also to uh, libraries in many other uh, national contexts. So I was in Hong Kong last year. They had just got approval for a, a shared um, repository um, um, uh, where the individual libraries will begin to share um, their collections. It's a big interest in the UK um, um, at the moment in the context of uh, discussions around UK research reserve and, and related. So as there is, um, as, as there is pressure on library space, libraries want to release more space for social learning, for engagement, for a higher uh, access to specialist material, access to specialist equipment, access to specialist expertise. And as the print collections release less value in the research and learning context, there's growing interest in making sure that the right print collections are available locally, but also that there's more space. And some, some people, some, some institutions especially, have a very pressing need for more space. So this has created an interest in moving up the responsibility for the print collections, thinking about managing print collections in groups, thinking about sharing print collections. Uh, OCLC is based in Ohio. We have OhioLink, a very successful consortium. Increasingly, Ohio is thinking about how do we begin to rationalize the print collections among Ohio universities and think about managing them more, more collectively at this um, collective level. This is a map of um, how the print resource in the US is, uh, is distributed. Um, Richard Florida, sort of e economist, geographer, has these uh, mega regions. He says that economic activity in the US clusters in several regions. You know, um, you've got Boz Wash, you know, so from Boston to Washington, Tor Buff Chester, uh, Chai Pits, where we are. Um, um, now, Unsurprisingly, the books cluster in these areas because this is where a lot of social activity, economic activity. Um, so if you did a map of wine drinking in the US, you'd get the same picture because this is where all the money and wine is, or all, all, the, all the people. You know. So it's not surprising that the books cluster in these areas. What's interesting about this picture, though, is that we used to think of the book collection as this big ocean. You know, that, 
it, it was endless. You couldn't get your arms around it. When, once we began quantifying it, though, this is using WorldCat, the OCLC database of, of books, um, uh, print uh, you know, information about library collections. Once you begin to quantify it, it's more like a reservoir. You can actually get your arms around it. You can manage it. You can think about it in various ways. And what's happened in the US is there are now a variety of regional resources that are looking at shared print initiatives, you know, shared management of print collections in, in these areas. Um, so I think this picture has actually been sort of influential in a quiet sort of way in making people realize that the print resource is manageable and it's finite. And it's um, now the, the yellow circle there, uh, those are the print collections that are not in one of the mega regions. So you can see that the majority of, of uh, print, they, they do co uh, congregate in those, in those areas. So uh, what's happening is um, very much people are beginning to think about the system-wide management of the print collection, uh, whether the system is a consortium, as with OhioLink or BTAA or um, Flair or West or East in, in the US, it's, or JULAC in Hong Kong. It's a region um, or it's a, a whole country. Um, so we've seen this uh, really emergence quite strongly the last few years of the collective print collection, thinking about how to make shared collections discoverable, shared and collectively stewarded. And this, this raises various right scaling issues. You know, at, at what level do you do things? So Ohio State University can do things with Ohio Link, it can do things with the Big Ten, this academic relationship, Hattie Trust. But the same thing is happening with research data. You know, University of Toronto, does it do stuff locally with T-Space? Does it do things in Ontario with the Scholars Portal? Does it do things at the Canadian level with Portage? So the network is making library collaboration more interesting, but also making people think, you know, have more choices about where to do and, and what to do. And this issue of right scaling, at what level do we do things, becomes, becomes quite interesting. So from a collective collection uh, point of view, you have reconfiguration of library collaboration by the network, by digital environment. This also drives an interest in the specialized collection. Arizona State University and MIT had a grant from Mellon to say, OK, if we start removing collections into shared print environments, what should we keep locally? What, what, you know, what are the characteristics of a smaller collection that you that you, that you keep uh, locally? You know, what, what, what is it that people want to prospect? You know, d does it relate to um, you know, curriculum? Does it relate to broader liberal education? Does it, what, what, you know, how do you, how do you uh, think about a collection where you're, where you're deliberately reducing its footprint? Um, so a large part of the existing print collection will move into shared stewardship in the next few years. Uh, I put a question mark there, although certainly in some environments that is happening. That means agreements are emerging around retention and sharing. Um, um, there is this aggregation, you could say collective collections as well, aggregations of digital material, scholarly material. How do you expose things to Google? And again, this decision about where to do things. So I've spoken about these three trends, re reconfiguration of research work by the network, inside out collection, reconfiguration of the information space by the network, facilitated collection, reconfiguration of library collaboration by the network, collective collection. And if you think about what each one involves, inside out collection is to create, manage, and make discoverable the evidence, community, memory of your institution, thinking about research data, preprints, thinking about expertise, thinking about special collections, pushing that from the inside out, making it more available, but also mobilizing it locally. Facilitate a collection, assemble a coordinated mix of local, external, collaborative resources around user needs. And then collective collection, increasingly we're seeing collections organized at the network or the system-wide level. From a boundaries point of view, I think it's, it's quite interesting in, if you think about the inside out collection, um, there's an intersection between collections and people interested in research workflows. So the whole liaison role um, um, and the library as a partner and advocate for the research process. Um, 
so this, this really is, is moving the library into partner and advocate with the research process, but also becoming part of that liaison role, understanding uh, how the library can assist with uh, research workflow, can assist with the management and curation of research outputs, can assist with advice about reputation, copyright, and so on. So that shifting boundary, um, quite, quite interesting there. Facilitated collection, uh, we have a shifting boundary in terms of um, um, between thinking about collections, but then also thinking about stuff like ILL, thinking about fulfillment, and again, thinking about the, the liaison role in terms of how do we uh, think about meeting our users' needs in a, in a variety of ways. And then collective collection, uh, collections and collaboration, clearly a big over, overlap with uh, interlibrary lending but also thinking about collection development in the context of a group of libraries rather than a single library, and what sorts of relationships and dependencies do you have with other libraries? Uh, what, what sorts of relationships are needed with them? So, um, I, just to conclude, the, uh, I do write about some of these things in this article, which appeared a while ago in Libra Quarterly. Um, um, and then, OCLC Research uh, has done a lot of work in the last few years on research support, special collections, um, thinking about uh, how uh, collective collections will pan out in, in this new environment. So we have a lot of material on our, our website that uh, provides some information about that. So I will stop there and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lorcan. We now move on to a question and answer session. So, Lorcan, if you care to have a seat here. So the, the floor is open. Um, so I'm inviting questions uh, for Lorcan on his uh, presentation or indeed on any other matter relating to collections. All problems solved by the look of it. <laughs> Uh, Lorcan, uh, some time ago, uh, it's going back uh, quite a, a number of years, um, we talked in the UK about uh, the distributed national collection and uh, indeed the di distributed national electronic uh, collection, or was it electronic resource? I can't quite recall mm -hmm. now. Uh, wh what do you think is the relationship b between those uh, concepts and that of the collective collection that you've talked about? I, I, um, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's very close. I think um, if you think about distributed national collection, which was thinking about uh, physical um, collections, you you now have uh, UK Research Reserve, which is looking at the uh, way in which um, you know libraries collectively might secure the the future of uh, particular collections. I think. Um, I think this type of activity has a bottom-up and a top-down uh, way of going. What, what you're seeing is uh, a large number of libraries are beginning to try and calibrate their collection in relation to some other group of collections. So as you mentioned, the UK, you know, you've got the White Rose Consortium, a group of uh, libraries in the north of England. You've got um, several other sort of groupings that are saying, well, uh, let's see how, how our collective collection overlaps, how it um, uh, is complementary, and, and what would happen if we tried to manage this um, together. At the same time, individual libraries are looking at uh, how do they manage down their individual collections in the context of what's available in the country as a whole, and we're seeing that happen in, in various areas. Um, so I think there is some activity in a UK context in, in that regard. What you don't have is a big national top-down plan. Although um, it seems to me there's, there are also discussions about coordinating that, coordinating that in various ways. Um, in the US context, what you're seeing is a lot of regional activity uh, and a variety of regional consortia have grown up to begin to manage 
that collective collection activity within within their region, and you know the U.S. doesn't tend to do big top-down things. In in other places, you know, it it, it may be more amenable to that sort of uh, national national attention, and you can see some organizations shifting their role a little bit. You've got somewhere like Caval in Australia, um, w which um, you know has always provided a particular type of service that is becoming maybe a little bit more relevant in this type of um, in this type of environment or this type of context. So um, I think. Um, I think you're seeing a little bit more bottom-up pressure that's creating some interest in greater coordination rather than major top-down activity. You're going to make Roger ask us, Ronald ask a second question. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, there is a microphone coming just behind you. Uh, you've talked about how publishers are moving into the research workflow business. How well do you see them succeeding? Well, I don't know. Um, so the, the question, yeah, the larger publishers moving into research workflow. Um, I, I, um, I, you know, I think it's especially interesting seeing um, the two big um, uh, operations. You, you know, you've got Elsevier on the one hand. And then you've got um, Springer Nature, which is part of the same family of companies as Digital Science. And Digital Science clearly is this set of smaller companies that have created a lot of interest. You know, you've got Figshare, you've got Symplectic, you've got Altmetric, um, you know, ReadCube. So um, uh, e in each case, you can see, um, you know, um, a variety of uh, workflow services. And I think, I think there are several things. Um, one is, uh, if you think about library budgets overall, I mean, clearly there's a cap there. So, you know, the, there's not going to be a lot more money in libraries. So if you want to look at revenue, it's, you, you know, if you look at the whole university, it's a, it's a different uh, issue. Then you also have things like um, shifting uh, models of publishing, what will happen to open access, you know, so um, um, thinking about diversifying that, that value. And then, frankly, I think you probably have user demand. You, you have um, gaps uh, where support is required in, in the research workflow that relates very much. It's just another step of which publishing is a part. So there's a whole series of, of things going on there as well. Then on the internal management side, the whole push around um, um, rankings, reputation, and the management of, of those outputs. So I think there's um, a lot of opportunity. Um, I mean, what's difficult is, as you uh, know, no doubt, is the huge variety in researcher practices, the huge variety in uh, expectations, the huge variety in um, um, uh, subject approaches, and uh, then you know, complexity involved in actually managing some of these things. So I, I think um, you know, it remains to be seen how and then also, there's a, there's a, in certain communities, there's very much a, a build-your-own approach or a reliance on, on particular tools and techniques developed by the community. So it's, it's, a, it's very complex and moving, and, and I think it's clear that um, it's clear where uh, certain publishers have made bets, and you know, we, we'll have to see how well, that, how, how well it turns out for them. But it's, it's quite a big space, and there's still quite a bit of opportunity in it, so. Thanks, Lorcan. Um, any further questions? Yes, please. Um, so, w here first, yep. Thank you. Yeah, hi, sorry. So, um, I think I'm very interested in the wine label collection that you shared earlier on. That one looks very interesting. So, I went to take a look at the website. So, um, would you actually know what is some of the work that is currently happening? With that collection. Yeah, because I saw that they are asking people to like describe and transcribe the label and all mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know uh, an enormous amount about it. I've heard uh, Mackenzie Smith, who's the university librarian, speak about it, and I've looked at the, at the uh, website. I think, I think you know, what, what I found particularly interesting about it was the um, Coming, coming together of, of maybe the three things, and I think, think I, I mentioned these. One is that they had this special collection of wine labels, and you, know, you could go and look at it or do whatever. And very much there was a desire, though, to make that more, more visible, more, more useful. 
But the second thing is they also have an interest in sort of data science and computational techniques and in making the library um, a, a place of expertise with uh, those um, skills, but also promoting those skills within the university and saying to the university we're a place of expertise. And the third thing is that this is an important area for the university. Um, so in terms of actually what they're doing, um, I, I don't know a huge amount about the, the mechanics of, of what they're doing, but um, um, basically they're, you know, what they want to convert a physical corpus that you have to go and inspect into something that can be manipulated and inspected and from which then you can derive certain, certain insights through the expertise that they have in the, in the sort of data science arena. Um, um, so I, the reason I, I put it up is that I think it's sort of um, indicative of a sort of new library skills coming together with an, uh, uh, an established area, but also very much focused on value to the institution, which I don't think answers your question. But, yeah. Thanks. I think, Bethany, you had a question? Or, thank you. Um. Um, hi, um, I just I'd like to know um, what is OCLC's role in facilitating the collective uh, collection? Uh, is there a role in relation to, especially there's WOCAT? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason um, um, if, if you think about um, uh, WorldCat, WorldCat is um, a uh, directory or registry of library collections around the world, and obviously we're more comprehensive in certain areas than in others. So um, we're more comprehensive in uh, the US, say, than in some other parts of the world. So certainly in, in the US and in other parts of, of the world, we would see um, um, people using WorldCat as a source of intelligence about what's in their individual collections compared to other collections. So we have a service called um, Green Glass, which allows you to compare your collection with collections elsewhere and sort of say, you know, we're strong here, we're less strong here, we have this sort of overlap with this peer group of libraries. So uh, that's a service that sort of helps you think about your collection in the context of a collective collection, whether it's a region or a, a group of neighborhood, you know, uh, neighboring libraries or whatever. We also uh, now allow you to register commitments. So one of the things that's come up is people want to know um, in the context of this sort of shift, um, I am going to keep this book for 10 years or in the context of my agreement in this consortium, I'm going to keep this book in 10 years, or um, you know, there's, there's, there's a range of consortia or, you know, in relation to HashiTrust, people are saying, we, we make a commitment to hold on to this resource for this number of years, because when you think about um, managing collections at an above the institution level, you want to know what the commitment is. So we now have the ability to register in WorldCat those um, types of commitments. Um, and then if you look at various of the initiatives which are pulling together um, um, shared print repositories or, or various other things, again, they're using WorldCat very much as a, as a resource for um, intelligence about, about what's in the network. I mean, one, one way of, of, of thinking about it is that um, where you have groups of libraries working together, they're sort of load balancing within the network. They're thinking about, okay, we, 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 we have a lot of this, we have a lot, you know, how do we put something here? How many copies do we need to keep? Um, so WorldCat helps with those types of things. And then also with the, the rarity, the scarcity, you know, we, we, you know the, it, it's a way of telling what, what materials might be especially rare. So certainly um, operationalizing collective collection activities in particular areas tends to rely quite a bit on WorldCat because of the intelligence and then we do have some specific services that help people do that. Yeah, if I may, Lachlan, we touched yesterday on an article that you wrote with one, uh, one or two of your colleagues uh, a good uh, 10 years ago in the early stages of what was then known as the Google Library Project and there was an, an analysis of collections of uh, 
Harvard, Stanford, uh, University of Michigan, uh, Oxford Libraries, and the New York Public Library, you might have thought that there would be uh, quite a great overlap uh, of those collections, but actually it turned out not to be so, uh, which I think was perhaps an unpleasant surprise for Google, but it's... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of my colleagues has a phrase that's quite nice. He says, uh, rareness is common. <laughs> um, so um, uh, library collections, I think, overlap um, less than we might have imagined. But as time goes on, they're overlapping more. And, you know, we, we, we acknowledge, oops, we acknowledge that our analysis is limited in certain ways. You know, if, if you think about, uh, one of my a couple of my colleagues did some work um, many years ago in, in, a UK, in a U.S. university where they, they took a sample of materials in the, from the library and they wanted to see what, what characterized unique or special or rare materials. And I can't remember, the, you know, there were three or four categories of material. One was cataloging mistakes. Um, <laughs> so they weren't really rare, it was just it was a cataloging mistake, so it looked as if it was rare because, um, you know, it didn't match up or it didn't. Um, two, um, you, you quite often get sort of locally assembled material, uh, you know, a, a group of articles that somebody asked to be bound together, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, that's not really especially interesting. Then you quite often have local material, you know, that local newsletter, local publications, you know, local things that are uh, of interest. And then you, you have things that are sort of unique or special or rare that is what people tend to think of when they think of rare. But the, the lesson was that what's unique or rare isn't necessarily interesting or valuable, but um, obviously some of what's unique or rare is interesting or valuable. Any, any further collections? Yes. Um, I'm more interested in how the electronic information is um, preserved because we see, um, for example, journals not being published in print. So there's mm -hmm. less print being sort of published. And then this is going to be this vacuum of who's actually preserving mm -hmm. this in that same way. Um, and also information seems to be coming less accessible through digital when you have, like, you have to be a member of a university and you have to have your, um, you know, ID to get into the library to, f to actually read something and you're relying on the public libraries but, you know, they're not always going to have the specialised material you want and you have, you know, the dark archive and all that but it's all patchy, you know, you've got open access, you've got this and that, things are being uh, only published digitally so I find that area uh, sort of a bit of a mess and I'm wondering what you think of that. No, I, I agree. <laughs> I think that was a good answer. The, um, yeah, no, I mean, that's true. I, mean, I did try and suggest it earlier, I think. Um, I think in a print world, the physical distribution model meant that, as I said, I think, you know, that in some ways preservation was a benign consequence of that distribution because, it, you know, it, it meant that maybe you could find a copy of the thing somewhere or in one of the libraries. Well, once you move to electronic material and stuff is centralized, then you have to actively manage um, preservation. Um, and then you get into the question, you know, you, you get into several questions. There's a collective action question, you know, that large groups of libraries find it very difficult to coordinate to get things done unless there's a strong incentive. You get, you get into an incentives issue that, you know, you know, who should do it, who should pay for it, why, you know, why should I do it, you know, it's somebody else's problem. You, you get into a who does it question, you know, there aren't agencies necessarily there to do it. So I think at the moment, um, it, it relies, as you say, on, on fragmentary and patchwork things. And I think you have, you have a few sort of heroic uh, initiatives, you know, that, you, know you, you have the Internet Archive, you have some of the work, say, that Herbert Van de Sample is doing, you have, you know, Portico on a smaller scale, but incomplete, you have locks and clocks and, uh, do, oh, there's a... Yeah, you have you know locks and clocks, and you know. So I, as I, I think you're, I think what you say is quite right, um, and it's it's sort of difficult to see how how or where um, you know something something uh, emerges from that because um, 
many libraries, you know, going back to the different types of libraries, I mean, I think some research libraries feel a responsibility to the scholarly record and preservation. Um, you know, libraries in, in more career oriented probably don't, um, and others, you know, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, complicated. Do we have any further questions? Well, if not at this stage, uh, there are refreshments available out in the foyer. Uh, Lorcan will be there, so do take the opportunity to have a chat with him and uh, ask any further questions. Um, thank you very much indeed, Lorcan. Thank you for being with us. Um, I know that journey from Ohio to Singapore and onwards to KL is quite taxing. Uh, and you've uh, managed to reverse the clock uh, by 12 hours. Uh, and well, I wish I could reverse it by 12 years. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for uh, a very thought-provoking uh, presentation. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Please, let's show our appreciation. Thank you.